Chapter 1, The Unusual Night of the Captive Princess Lord Melbourne descended from the carriage and seeing the rest of the guests as they entered the palace, he felt his last doubts dissipate. Until the last moment, I had hesitated to attend. After all, he was not a member of the cabinet, and his absence would not be so remarkable, and really that night he did not feel a special desire to socialise at one of the great fates of the ruling elite of United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Lord Melbourne already had a political career of more than 20 years, most of which he had spent in the House of Commons since when he was very young his legal father had bought for him his first seat in the House. But in all those years Lord Melbourne had only held a position in the government, that of Chief Secretary for Ireland, for a little more than a year. A little over two years ago, Lord Melbourne's father, or rather the man who, because he was married to Lord Melbourne's mother, was legally his father but almost certainly was not, his real father must be had been a lover of his mother, had died and Lord Melbourne had inherited from him the title of Viscount Melbourne and thus entered the House of Lords of Parliament. The same year Lord Melbourne's wife, Lady Caroline, had died, the woman who with her adulterous affair with Lord Byron and her scandalous consequences had humiliated Lord Melbourne before the whole country and for more than ten years caused him enormous suffering. Lord Melbourne acknowledged to himself, not without some shame, that the death of Caroline, although it caused him some regret, had brought him peace and also the death of his father, who never showed him affection by knowing the truth about his fatherhood. The only source of suffering for Lord Melbourne was his only child, a sick boy, with what one day in the future would be known as autism. But with devotion and affection, Lord Melbourne took care of his son, whom he did not consider a burden but the only reason to live that he had left. Now Lord Melbourne was experiencing an auspicious moment in his political career, because it was a fact that his political party, the Whig Party, would soon reach the government and most of the rumours were that Lord Melbourne would be appointed Home Secretary and would be the most important man in the new cabinet, after the Prime Minister. Some even predicted that one day he could be Prime Minister. So it was not surprising that Lord Melbourne received an invitation to the reception hosted by the new King William IV, who a few months earlier had inherited the crown from his brother George IV, who had no legitimate offspring after the death of his only daughter. The King celebrated the reception in St. James's Palace, which was reserved for parties and ceremonies, as William IV was still residing in Clarence House, his London residence before becoming King. But at first Lord Melbourne did not feel like accepting the invitation, because both the previous King and the new King were not people who aroused much sympathy in him. And he who had always loved social life, balls and parties of high society, Lately he preferred a quieter life in his home and if it was mundane amusements, he preferred those that were practiced in the privacy of a bedroom, both in a brothel as at home, both with a prostitute and with a willing lady of the aristocracy, that the flesh does not discriminate in the pleasure. He was almost determined to find an excuse to decline the invitation, but then he felt a rare sensation, a feeling of anxiety, of rare emotion. Every time he thought about the invitation, he felt a little like a child who was announced that he would live an exciting but at the same time intimidating adventure, with that mixture of nerves and desires. And he felt an alarm of his instinct, that instinct that had rarely awakened in his life to announce an important event, but the few times it had done it he had not erred. The fact is that something that was born in his insides told him that he could not miss that appointment with destiny, that he had to go that night. So Lord Melbourne dressed appropriately for the elegant gentleman he was and for an occasion like that, and left leaving his son in the care of the servants and the ever loyal and helpful Susan, a bastard daughter of a member of the family of his deceased wife whose care she had assumed and that he had inherited as a responsibility. Upon arriving at the reception he soon relaxed and began to socialise with the rest of the guests, many politicians like him, all them aristocrats, also like him with their wives and their children of age to attend such social events. Lord Melbourne knew the majority, and because of his charming personality, so seductive, amusing and conciliatory, he had cordial relations with almost everyone, even with his political rivals. And the women simply adored him, they admired that handsome, elegant, chivalrous and charming man, who despite the public derision to which his wife had subjected him, remained irresistible to women of all ages. 
At one point in the evening, Lord Melbourne found himself talking to the Duke of Wellington, the great hero of the Napoleonic Wars who at that time was the Prime Minister and the leader of the Tory or Conservative Party, the rival party of the Whig Party, to which Lord Melbourne belonged. But because of the paradoxes of British politics, at the end of his brief term as Chief Secretary for Ireland, Lord Melbourne had served the government presided over by Wellington. William Lamb, Lord Melbourne, the rising star of the Whig Party. I think you'll soon have a seat in a Whig cabinet, said the Duke of Wellington with a mocking smile. I do not know, Your Grace. I see you still firm in your position, replied Lord Melbourne mockingly, in the same tone as his old boss in the government. Do not make fun of me, William. You and me know it's a matter of weeks, after the outcome of the general election my government is sentenced to fall and then it will be your party's chance to form a government, said Wellington, sounding resigned and indifferent, referring to the fact that in general election of the summer of that year of 1830 the Tory party of Wellington had won but with a simple or relatively small relative majority that guaranteed the prompt fall of a weakened government. I'm sorry, Duke although as a Whig I must be happy that my party regains power, I'm sorry that it's at your expense," said Lord Melbourne sincerely. Thank you, but I do not regret it as much as I should, as a commander in the war I was very popular, but as Prime Minister, I have been unreasonably unpopular and I fear that I am sick of enduring so much stupidity and insolence. You have to be patient to rule this country. Maybe one day you will know. At least for the moment, you'll be Home Secretary," Wellington replied. I do not know, there is nothing written, said Lord Melbourne, prudently. Come on, William, do not be silly, we know that when the Earl Grey has my job, he will appoint you, Home Secretary, surely, and so, you will have the job of Sir Robert," Wellington said turning his gaze to Robert Peel, who was talking to some guests and that was the current Home Secretary, and I'm glad because you're perhaps the best Whig there is, and in fact I would like you to be Tory, and so you would have been my successor. Your only fault is to be a damned Whig." Wellington added mockingly, but sincerely. You honour me, Duke. I would love for you to be Whig, but every man has his faults, Lord Melbourne replied candidly but sarcastically, and they both laughed. While Wellington and Lord Melbourne were talking, a carriage was approaching the palace carrying in its, some curious and important characters. It was the Duchess of Kent, the widow of Prince Edward, Duke of Kent and Strathan, one of the children of King George III. With her was John Conroy, the controller and private secretary of the Duchess, the man who acted as her right hand and most likely her lover. With the couple was the daughter of the Duchess and her late husband, Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Hanover. The death of Charlotte, the only legitimate child of George IV, and Victoria's female cousin, and the death of other members of the royal family, as well as other coincidences such as the incapacity of the wife of new King William IV, Queen Consort Adelaide, to give birth to a viable child who could survive, made Victoria the heir to the crown, and unless an unexpected event occurred, she would be the reigning queen when her uncle William died. But that fact it would have been a dream for any girl. In Victoria's case it was her curse because since she was born and her father died when she was only a few months old, Victoria had been practically a prisoner of her own mother and of Conroy. They kept her secluded and isolated in the apartments they occupied in Kensington Palace and did not allow her contact even with other children her age. Victoria's only true friend in her still short life had been her half-sister Theodora, her mother's daughter and older than her but when Victoria was less than nine years old her sister got married and Victoria was left alone. Her only company and consolation was her governess, Baroness Lazen, who loved her as if she were her daughter, and who travelled with them that night in the carriage. I would very much prefer not to have to attend the reception offered by that hateful and scoundrel man, said the Duchess, showing in her face a gesture of disdain. Yes, but unfortunately that despicable man is the King of England and for our misfortune, we have to deal with him," Conroy replied also with a gesture of disdain. Victoria and Baroness Lazen exchanged a meaningful look, and then Victoria looked away, from the carriage window to see the street, 
with a gesture of disgust and disapproval on her face. The natural dignity of Victoria, her innate consciousness as heir of the British crown and future reigning monarch, awoke in her, absolute and unconditional respect for the person who girded the crown, regardless of whether it was worthy or not of that dignity. That's why Victoria could only feel loyalty to her uncle William, although because of her mother and Conroy she had grown up away from him and that's why she could not have developed a niece's love for him. But what most infuriated Victoria is that an upstart scoundrel like Conroy, a man of inferior social origin, dared to speak with such disdain and insolence from the monarch of the British Empire of which even the most exalted nobles were supposed to speak with respect and devotion, and the worst thing is that her own mother encouraged him and did the same. Victoria thought that when she would be queen she would not tolerate or forgive anyone saying even a quarter of what her mother and Conroy said about her uncle. Besides, ma'am, that rascal insisted so much on your attendance tonight, and refusing to do so would have unleashed one of his famous tantrums. And at this time it is not convenient for your interests, it is necessary to take advantage tonight to try to negotiate with that man an improvement in your assignment, and establish the best possible conditions regarding your role as Dina's guardian, and thus improve the conditions that you obtained under the reign of your late brother-in-law George," said Conroy. Victoria arrived in her angry seat, hated how Conroy referred to her as Dina, using a familiarity that was disrespectful, even contemptuous, and rude, when it was appropriate to refer to her as Royal Highness or Princess. But that was not the worst she had endured from Conroy she had had to suffer things much worse, insults and intimidation that bordered on emotional and even physical abuse. Victoria caught a glimpse of her faithful governess, knowing that it was even worse for her. Baroness Lazen suffered like an impotent mother to defend her daughter. Victoria knew that whenever Conroy insulted her, mocked her, threatened her or cornered her in an intimidating way as if he were about to hit her, Baroness Lazen burned with rage and anguish but she had to restrain herself because if she was openly confronting Conroy and the Duchess would get fired and they would take her away from Victoria, who would be totally helpless. But Lazen hated Conroy and despised his insolence and arrogance, his violent and authoritarian nature, as much as Victoria, and she also despised the Duchess for not defending her daughter from the lout. But I am angered and anguished that this man insisted that Dina accompany us and that we have yielded to his stupid demand. We have kept Dina away from social events precisely so that she stays pure and does not become contaminated with the vices of the decadent court. Especially to protect her from the pernicious immoral influence of unscrupulous people like this indecent man, and now we are going to expose her to that corrupt and hypocritical ambience. I still think we should have left Dina in Kensington, said the Duchess apparently anguished. I agree with you, ma'am, as always but it is hard to resist when the King of England insists so vehemently that he wants to see his niece and his heiress presumptive. We have managed to preserve Dina from the example of his depravity, from the nefarious influence of his vicious and infamous personality, but after all, even if he does not deserve it, he is the King of the British Empire and is beginning his reign, we pray that be brief, and as I said before, Your Highness, at this time it is convenient to be clever and not to make man unnecessarily angry, especially when we try to negotiate with him the best for your interests as a mother and legal guardian of the future Queen of England. Sometimes you have to be clever to defeat the enemy, ma'am, Conroy replied with his usual arrogance. I know, Sir John, and as I always say I do not know what we would do without you but it scares me to expose my little Dina to the influence of that man and his corrupt court. I am especially distressed that my innocent Dina is in contact with the bastards of that scoundrel, it is the height of shame that this man fills the court of his bastards, the product of his shameful deeds. Surely they will be at the reception today, said Duchess irritated. Mama, attending an invitation from the king is an honor for any loyal subject and should be more so in our case as members of the royal family. And as my uncle's presumptive heiress, it is my duty to attend his call, and I am sure that as the brother of my dear father the king only has good feelings and intentions for me," said Victoria unable to remain silent. Dina, it is your ingenuity and ignorance of worldly matters that speaks, fruit of your young age and the innate limitations of your intellect," Conroy replied gloating to mock Victoria's intelligence 
but fortunately for you you have your mother for protect yourself from the dangers of the real world, so different from that fantasy world in which you live with your dolls, he added with disguised disdain. Precisely why I can benefit from the closeness to the king, my uncle, who can teach me to reign, something that as you noticed it does not learn it living next to dolls, replied Victoria, responding to the disdain of Conroy with an intelligent response and matures for her age that contradicted Conroy's arguments about her alleged lack of intelligence. Again it's the girl who speaks for you, your highness, said Conroy, pronouncing the word highness with irony and contempt as always he used it with Victoria, a girl who is as short in her intellect and understanding of the world as in her height, added with perverse mockery aggravated by a stupid giggle of the Duchess, but fortunately for you, you have intelligent and mature people to supply your needs, and protect you and prevent you from making serious mistakes. It is true, Sir John, that I am short of intelligence, maybe that's why I find it difficult to understand how it can help my mother's cause to have moved away from my uncle William knowing that he was going to be king, and speaking of him in terms that would be considered treason, Victoria replied with irony, trying to take revenge for the insult and mockery of Conroy. Sir John's face was covered with anger. Shut up, Dina. We have tried so hard to prepare you to be a queen that does not embarrass this country, and every day you show with your capricious and childish behavior, and with your ingratitude towards your mother that you are not worthy of that effort. As if it were not enough you to be so tiny that the English should ask themselves if they do not have a gnome on the throne they will also have a silly girl who embarrasses them with her ignorance. Conroy exclaimed almost hysterically and coming forward to approach intimidatingly to Victoria, who was sitting in front of him and who sank into her seat humiliated and scared. Victoria wept with rage, humiliation and impotence, as always when Conroy shouted at her. Beside her, Lazen lowered her head with a gesture of anger on her face, and clenched the fist of her right hand as if she wanted to use it to hit Conroy. Dina, Sir John is right, you must not be so ungrateful and childish. Sir John knows what is best for you and me. But I beg you not to be angry, Sir John, I need you come and focus to advise me and protect me from the infamy of that evil man, said the Duchess putting herself once more on the side of Conroy against her own daughter. You're right as always, ma'am. I just hope that Dina remembers the instructions we gave her, that she is prudent, that she does not talk to anyone, that she does not turn away from us, and above all that she does not talk stupidly with the king, in point of fact, that she talks as little as possible with him. Will you do it, Dina? Said Conroy with a tone still angry and threatening with Victoria. Victoria nodded and then looked away to see through the car window, crying quietly. While the Duchess and Conroy chatted animatedly about their intrigues, Victoria felt the hand of her affectionate and faithful Lazen squeezing her little hand. Victoria saw her with gratitude and affection and felt like hugging her and plunging her head into her lap, but she knew she could not do it. But they exchanged an affectionate smile. Then Victoria felt sad because as an eleven-year-old girl she was, who had grown up in such cruel isolation, going to a big party at the palace should be an excellent opportunity to change her boring routine and savor a little happiness and freedom. But the company of Conroy and her mother, with their petty intrigues and their cruel treatment towards her, guaranteed that she would not have fun and on the contrary, she was going to live an irritating and unpleasant night. Only the presence of Lazen consoled her a little, and as many times before she wishes she had been the daughter of Baroness Lazen and not her mother. Being younger had fantasized sometimes that her deceased father she did not know had married Lazen and lived to educate her with Baroness, who despite being strict and overprotective was much more affectionate and cared more for her than her mother. Victoria prepared for a horrible night, but fate mocks humans and their expectations. Arriving at the reception, Conroy asked the servants not to announce the arrival of Victoria with the customary pomp of the crown's presumptive heiress. And he asked that they are led discreetly into the presence of the king. When a servant led them to a corner of the wide space where the reception was taking place, Conroy went to Lazen. Baroness, it would be better you to mix with the guests and wait for us while we talk to the king, it would not be appropriate for the princess's governess to participate in such a sensitive conversation with the king. In fact, 
I think it would annoy His Majesty, said Conroy. Yes, Sir John, Lazen answered with discouragement. Lazen stopped and saw the group as it moved away from her, trying to smile at Victoria who turned her head to see her with anxiety and anguish, nervous not to have the moral support of Lazen. Victoria and the others kept walking. In one place in the large room was King William conversing with his wife Queen Adelaide, both standing. I just hope that tonight ends soon, this type of events bores me and tire me, people will have to get used to that in my reign things will not be like in George's reign, I will not hold parties or receptions frequently, the king replied with a snort of annoyance. Yes, but at least the beginning of your reign was necessary to offer some events of this kind. Well, I hope. Oh, I'm afraid your main guests arrived, said the queen as she watched as a servant entered the room escorting the Duchess, Conroy and Victoria. The king turned to see them and then looked back at his wife. That damn woman! Can not go anywhere without her lap dog? It is intolerable that I have to lower myself to talk about my niece's future with that upstart bastard. The king protested loudly and with a gesture of anger on his face. William, please, you're right, but you must control yourself. You must control your temper, do not let the Duchess and that horrible man make you lose your head, and even less in front of Alexandrina and the guests, said the Queen worried. I'll try, but I promise nothing, the King replied angrily. The Duchess, Conroy and Victoria greeted the King and the Queen. The greeting was tense and uncomfortable between the King on the one hand and the Duchess and Conroy on the other side a little less between them and the Queen. On the other hand, the greeting was affectionate and happy between Victoria, her uncle, and her aunt. I'm glad to see you, Dina, you look more beautiful than the last time we saw each other, said the Queen with a sweet and lovely smile. That, unfortunately, was a long time ago, said the King looking sideways at the Duchess and Conroy, but Adelaide is right, you look very beautiful and you begin to look like an adult woman. Victoria smiled delighted and proud. His Majesty has a good sense of humor, with her height Dina could hardly seem more adult, said Conroy with irony, trying to sound joker. Victoria gave a sad gesture on her face and bowed her head, embarrassed and humiliated, while the King's face covered with a gesture of anger. Mr. Conroy, height has nothing to do with beauty and maturity, nor does it have anything to do with intelligence, honor and decency as evidenced by the fact that some very tall men are very low morale and intelligence, said the king seeing Conroy, with poorly disguised disdain, on the other hand, I think that the appropriate treatment of you for my niece would be that of royal highness, right? He added contemptuously. Conroy was furious. Later on the initiative of the queen, the group moved to a small room attached to the large room where the main part of the reception was held. Conroy and the Duchess began to make their demands, and the Queen with concern saw how her husband's face showed increasing anger. Victoria also felt increasingly tense and uncomfortable, knowing that Conroy's absurd demands were going to cause a storm. Do you really expect me to even consider this nonsense? Said the angry King addressing the Duchess, I cannot believe this brazenness. Your Majesty, I believe. Said Conroy. I do not speak with you, Mr. Conroy, the future of the heiress of the crown can only be discussed by the members of the royal family and the relatives of the heiress. In fact, I only tolerate your presence, as a deference to the Duchess, but you really should not even be present in this discussion," said the King angrier. William, Conroy is my trusted adviser, and he's done a great work taking care of me and Dina since your brother's tragic death. I do not know what Dina and I would have done without him," protested the angry Duchess. That is precisely why I believe you are not fit to continue being the guardian of my niece, of the heiress of the British crown, and that's why I think I should assume that role," replied the King. What? exclaimed the Duchess. The King got into a strong argument with the Duchess and Conroy, while the Queen and Victoria contemplated everything with anguish and displeasure. It is outrageous that you want to strip me of the custody of my own daughter!" exclaimed the furious Duchess. Outrageous is that I am not allowed to see my niece and presumptive heiress. 
It is outrageous that my niece is subjected to total isolation of the world, including her own family and the country over which she would reign. Outrageous is that the future of the heiress of the crown is decided by a leech, by an upstart who does not even have titles or an aristocratic lineage!" exclaimed the king while the alcohol stimulated him and uninhibited his tongue. Your Majesty, with all due respect, I must protest against this unjust and injurious treatment, said Conroy offended. Tell me, Mr. Conroy, were you not the son of a lawyer? Did not your family belong to the so-called middle class? No titles, no noble blood, a simple anonymous, army officer who had the fortune to dupe my brother and then my sister-in-law. With what damn right do you think you can decide the fate of the future Queen of England and dare to discuss it with me?" The hysterical king shouted. Conroy was livid, with anger and trembled, his eyes wet. The Duchess tried to reply to defend him, but the king shouted louder, and soon began to insult Conroy and the Duchess herself, while the queen tried to calm him down. The disastrous end of the scene occurred when Conroy left while the king continued shouting insults and walked behind him while the queen tried to hold him by the arm, and the Duchess and Victoria walked behind them, and some guests watched the scene in amazement. The queen managed to keep her husband who kept screaming, but Conroy did not stop and the Duchess cried while trying to reach him, ignoring her daughter who was calling her. I need to be alone, Duchess said Conroy to experience the feeling of being humiliated instead of being he who humiliates another. Please, John, do not leave, let's talk first, Duchess call for, through tears, losing any trace of dignity, but Conroy was moving away from her and almost lost sight of him. Please, Mama. Let him go. That man only hurts us, you must listen to my uncle. We do not need him. Victoria begged. Shut up! exclaimed the Duchess turning around and shaking her daughter by the shoulders, stupid and ungrateful girl. Go and find Lazen, and wait for us at the exit while I'm looking for Sir John, and do not you dare embarrass me, enough shame already you've caused me in your short life. The Duchess left looking for Conroy, leaving her crying inconsolably. Dina saw that some guests were beginning to notice her and she felt that she only wanted to be alone, that she did not want to talk to anyone, so she left almost running. Meanwhile, Wellington and Lord Melbourne were still talking in a corner away from in the palace, when a servant approached them and spoke in the ear to the Duke. Your Grace, His Majesty demands your presence, there has been an incident with the Duchess of Kent. Wellington sighed irritably. William. If fate wants you to become Prime Minister one day I hope you have better luck with the royal family that I have had, believe me, I prefer a stormy and disastrous session in the house than having to suffer the problems it causes our royal house," said Wellington between resignation and annoyance. Duke, I will listen to your advice, if someday I have the misfortune of being Prime Minister I will keep away from the court as much as my obligations allow me, and I am sure that my absence will not be regretted. Lord Melbourne replied mockingly. Wellington retired and Lord Melbourne decided to take advantage of the moment to go out into the garden for a moment to breathe fresh air and contemplate the work of the King's gardeners and compare it with his own work in Brockett Hall. He inhaled the air, enjoying the fragrances of the garden, and looked up to see for a moment the starry sky. And then he heard a sound, that of a cry. Out of curiosity, Lord Melbourne approached the place where the crying came from and saw a little girl, a very small girl, very thin, who was sitting on a bench in the garden, crying inconsolably and pouting, her face sunken in hands. Lord Melbourne felt a little uncomfortable for a few moments, because he was invading someone else's privacy, and the idea of turning around and leaving was fleeting in his mind. But he heard the girl's desperate cry and quickly felt that compassion replaced his initial doubts. His gentlemanly nature, sincere in him while it was hypocritical in other supposed gentlemen, did not allow him to leave alone a damsel in distress, especially in a small girl who cried so plaintively. So he approached slowly. Sorry, excuse me, are you okay? Lord Melbourne asked with kindness and caution. Victoria was startled to hear the deep voice of Lord Melbourne and turned to see him, and he shuddered to see the beautiful blue eyes of the girl full of tears, 
like two small lagoons, overflowing. Lord Melbourne felt that that sad and helpless look pierce him. Victoria was also shocked to see those beautiful green eyes fixed on hers. No, do not worry, sir, it's just that. Victoria answered but could not continue because she drowned in almost hysterical crying. Excuse me, my lady. I do not want to bother you, but it is evident that you are not well. Please, I beg you to let me help you, I cannot be indifferent to your crying. Take, dry your tears, said Lord Melbourne taking out a handkerchief his jacket and giving it to Victoria. Victoria took the handkerchief shyly and wiped away her tears. Lord Melbourne was silent for a moment, standing next to Victoria, waiting for her to calm down. My lady, what can I do for you? Do you want me to look for your family or companions? Lord Melbourne asked concerned and kind. No, sir. I prefer that you do not. I prefer that they do not see me like this, Victoria answered, anguished and ashamed. I understand, my lady but I want to help you in some way. I cannot help but be moved by the tears of a lady, Lord Melbourne said with a lovely smile. A lady? Do you mean me, gentlemen? Victoria asked surprised and a little suspicious. Of course, my lady, answered Lord Melbourne speaking seriously, kindly. My lady? But I'm just a girl, Victoria replied bewildered. Really? Well. You really are very young, but obviously, you are a lady, my eyes do not deceive me. I see a young woman who dresses like a lady and speaks as one, and therefore you are a lady, perhaps very young but you are still," Lord Melbourne said speaking sincerely and calmly, knowing how important and flattering it was for a girl to be treated like an adult woman, forgive my impertinence, why are you surprised to receive my lady's treatment? Are not you used to to the treatment appropriate to your status? Victoria was surprised and then it was when she realized, the man did not know who she was, did not know that she was the heiress of the crown and not even that she belonged to the royal family. The man thought that she was a girl from an aristocratic family but not from royalty, and could not help feeling excited. No, of course, it's just that I was so upset that I did not even know what you were saying, I'm sorry, sir. Your treatment is the right one, Victoria said not knowing very well why she was lying to that stranger and hiding her true identity. I understand, do not worry, when I'm upset even forgetting my name, by the way, I'm very clumsy and impolite, and I apologize. We have not been introduced properly, so my duty was to do it myself and not I have done it, my name is William Lamb, 2nd Viscount Melbourne. Lord Melbourne. Lord Melbourne said extending his hand towards her. Confused, Victoria needed a few moments to understand that he expected her to shake her hand. Trying not to be too clumsy, Victoria extended her arm and offered her small hand to Lord Melbourne, who took it and leaning down, with his lips brushed the back of the girl's hand, like the gallant salute of a gentleman to a lady that was customary in high society. Victoria felt an electric current when Lord Melbourne's lips brushed her skin, her skin bristled and she blushed. Then she would remember that it was the first time that a man who was not of her family kissed any part of her body.